of having Robbie Patterson with us. So I'm just going to invite you to come up and, and share whatever God has put on your heart. And if you, if you, if you preach in English, I'll translate it. If you, if, no, if you preach in, if you preach in Spanish, I'll translate it into English. Yeah, I have enough problems with English. <laughs> Amen. Thank you guys so much for having us. God is good. Amen. 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 Pastor Dave, I like the beard. Oh, Praise God. I, uh, after I became under sheriff, I changed the policy so that we could have facial hair. And I came in with a beard and Pastor Dave pointed it out. I was like, I, sir, I just want to be more like Jesus. <laughs> just wanted, that's all I could do. God is good. Amen. 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 We, we've been having a great privilege of being able to minister across denominational lines and in different places. That's the kind of God we serve. And, and a lot of times people even ask me, like, well, man, I, preaching the way you do. I don't know what they mean by that. <laughs> How do you get to go to this church or that church? And the reality of it is people are so hungry for God, they just want something real. That's the reality of it. They want you to be honest and sincere. They want it to look like Jesus. No, just in general, people who go to church, people who name the name of Christ, I think so many times whenever we're in an endeavor to explain how to operate in different aspects of the kingdom, we end up causing denominational walls that God never put there. People want the Jesus of the Bible. The one you see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The one that rose again victoriously. The one that, that is living inside of us by way of the Holy Spirit. That's what people want. And, and, it, and as much as I can move me out of the way and live out that Christian life as much as I'm willing to yield to the Holy Spirit, I'll see Him manifest in my life. And we're getting to a place in our culture, in our society, to where if we don't step out of the way, decrease so that he may increase, if, if we keep refusing and, and holding up denominational barriers and holding up, and this is what I've been doing for 25 years, and this is what my group believes, if we keep doing that, there's going to be a destruction, not sent from God, but just reaping what's been sown. And I just want to start off with that high note. Praise God. <laughs> I, I actually want to, um, I want to start off with, with a, an excerpt from a book. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I'm going to be talking about perceiving the kingdom or kingdom perception. And I want to start off with this. This is from a book called Jesus with Dirty Feet. That's a weird name for a book. It's by a man named Don Everest. <coughs> And it's more of like in a poetry form, but the reason why I'd wanna, I want to start off with this because it's about Jesus Christ. This is what it says. There was just something so clear and beautiful and true and unique and powerful about Jesus that old rabbis would marvel at his teaching. Young children would run up and sit in his lap. Ashamed prostitutes would find themselves weeping at his feet. Whole villages would gather to hear him speak. Experts in debate would find themselves speechless. And people from the poor to the rugged working class to the unbelievably wealthy would leave everything to follow him. That's, that's big. That's powerful. You see, the... The more I pray, the more I read the scripture, the more I walk this out, because a lot of people don't understand. I mean, I, I, was, I was born again in, in churches where they were flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, had the power of God there. And then when I, I went with the military, I knew I, I've had this desire to preach. I wanted to go to Bible school. And, and, I, and I listened to these people that I trusted there, and they convinced me to go to this certain Bible college and it was more of like, like reformed theology and more of a, a, that mindset of it. And man, it, it almost killed me. It almost destroyed anything good about God I ever thought about. 
And I found a way to, to, to break free from that and get, and get through different hurdles and, and get rid of the doubt and unbelief that they, were, that they were intent on enforcing upon you. And I, I ended up coming to a place to where I was almost like, man, forget it all. Until I had an encounter with this Jesus. Not the one that some denomination made up. Not the one that somebody made up that looked like them. And, and the more I realized this in praying and in looking at it, why did I do the things I did? Why did that man, I know he had a heart for God, but why did he position it in such a way? Why was this? And what it really comes down to is, is an attempt to make Jesus look like me. And because I know that I'm totally right and everything I do is perfect, I must be the pinnacle. And people get that way of thinking because they spend so much of their life directed by the flesh, directed by the way they think and their own effort. And they think, look at how hard I'm trying to serve God. This must be the end of it. Instead of me realizing that this Christian life is so big, is so miraculous, is so supernatural, that I have to acknowledge that all things are possible. That I have to acknowledge that with this God, I can't have any box, any barrier. This Jesus that we're talking about is so big and so powerful. He brought his kingdom with him. And then not only did he bring his kingdom with him, but then he positioned up to where we could, when we receive him and are reborn, born again, he takes this kingdom and he places it in you and among you. To where even though we're in a fallen world, surrounded by rebellion against God, we are here establishing a different king and a different kingdom. And seeing people... Exit the kingdom of man, the kingdom of sin, the kingdom of Satan, and come into the kingdom of God's dear son. And I can try to explain what that looks like. But oh man, that's so big. That's people being born again and changing their whole lives. That's people who were, who were in things that you think were unbelievably sinful and filthy, getting washed up and changed and made something brand new. That's people getting healed. That's people getting demons driven out of. That's people getting totally delivered from everything that the enemy sent to kill them. That's what we're talking about. I'm going to, I want to begin reading to you a portion in Romans, in Romans chapter 6. And, and I want you to hear the mindset that the Apostle Paul, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, writing to believers, writing to Christians, and the mindset he's explaining how to come to a realization of what's already been done inside of them, how to start living out this relationship with God. In Romans chapter 6, in verse 6, he said, knowing this, this is something that everybody who names the name of Christ knows. This is something, if you are born again, you know this. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, with Christ. Now, and, and I know the mindset of, 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 I'm just fighting the old man. The old man's dead. In Christ. And guess what? Dead people don't fight good. Well, what's really happening is this computer that was programmed by that old man, that's what you're fighting. Because in this same letter, by the time he gets to chapter 12, he's going to start saying, now in order for you to see this, in order for you to see real transformation, what you have to do is you have to be conformed by renewing your mind to what we're talking about. Don't, be, don't allow this world to beat you into a mold to conform you to its image, but you be transformed, metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind. That's where he's going. But in this portion, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth from this moment on, you should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin now. 
So he started off with something that every Christian knows. He said, now that I've established that, you know that, you acknowledge that. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And so many times I thought this just meant in the sweet by and by one day. But I want you to see this transition. Verse 19, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Verse 10, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God likewise. In that same, you understand the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, or you're not a Christian. He's saying you're, you're a believer. You understand he died and he rose again in the same way that you see the death, burial, and resurrection. In the same way you acknowledge that he has won this victory, likewise reckon. Now, Paul wasn't from the south. He wasn't saying, I reckon. No, what he was saying was, what that word is consider, reason out, make an on purpose decision, acknowledge this. Reckon you also yourselves. Start seeing yourself a different way. Reckon also yourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon it. See it this way. I want to read that verse in a few other translations. Uh, in the New Living Translation, he said, so you should consider. Consider this. See it this way. Consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do you see it that way? The Good News Translation in the same way you are to think of yourselves. I deal with a lot of people. A lot of people ask for counseling and different things. And it all comes back to the way they think of themselves. They see themselves as the sum total of their past mistakes. They see themselves as this totaled up of the bad choices they've made. Instead of what he says here. Every one of the failures that I've ever seen in my life was because I did not see myself this way. I didn't understand, recognize, think of myself as being dead to sin and alive to God. And then I would by faith do the wrong thing because of how I saw myself. Because of the way I perceived the kingdom of God as something far away one day in the sweet by and by. And man, I just got to suffer with what's going on now. Instead of me realizing that I've got a job here to do. Instead of me realizing that, that not only do I have a job and a role here, because in, in the season that we're entering into right now, all of us, we, we have to mature in this area to where we start realizing, I've got to start seeing both sides of the truth of God. I've got, now, I first realized this whenever it came to the way the Scripture points out that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. In the Word and in truth. In the Spirit and in truth. And, and, and I was leaned more toward the truth side. I just wanted to get more into the Word side, and I would neglect the spiritual side. I recall I was in one church, and, and uh, I was say there was this, this one lady there, and, and she was... She was like really, real, like she was dancing all the time and whirling and praising God. And, 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 I, and I, I, I misjudged her. I saw it as something fake. The way she acted, the way she carried herself, I feel like she's, she's putting on. Why don't she sit down and stop that? She's being a distraction. And, and she was going through that, doing that one time. And it was during a portion of a prayer service, and she stopped and looked at me and walked right at me and said, I got a word from God for you, and basically walked through something that I had been pleading and struggling with and in prayer for. I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but because of my tendency was more towards the word side, towards the truth side, and I was neglecting the spiritual side. You see, there has to come a place to where, because I'm more of the, the fight, the good fight of faith guy. Instead of the stand, therefore. 
Hey, I, I, I didn't want to be the one that was, I wanted to be the one that, that was pushing instead of the one that was yielding. The one that was striving for the kingdom instead of the one who was resting in the sonship of God. But you see, the season we're entering into now, each and every one of us needs to grow in our, in our understanding of both sides, in our reality of both sides, so that we can walk in it, so that we can both lead and follow in it. But whenever it comes to changing this mindset, I was reading that in the good news. In the same way to you are to think of yourselves as a dead so far as sin is concerned, but living in fellowship with God through Christ Jesus. Do you own purpose? Think of yourself as living in fellowship with God. I'm telling you, I have to do that more than what I've been doing it. I have to start on purpose meditating on this relationship with God, this fellowship with God, so that I can acknowledge His kingdom in my life, so that I can present, begin to perceive the kingdom of God in a greater way, so that I can move when He says move, so that I can stop when He says stop. Jesus, in Mark chapter 8, verse 17, He's speaking to the disciples. Now, now in context, in verse 15, he had just spoken to them and he said, now you beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And now because they weren't perceiving the kingdom, they started thinking, man, he's mad about bread. We should have brought some bread. <laughs> but in reality, now, now you can see from his teaching, he's pointed out several times the leaven of the Pharisees as that that mindset of, of religion, of, of, of religious hypocrisy. You can see from his teaching that mindset of, of Herod, that mo most, what we would call atheism really, or that godlessness. And, and we see that that has permeated in so many places to where people have a view of God that just does not look like Jesus. Even in churches. They'll get up and start talking about God's going to punish you and God's going to get you and, and doesn't look anything like Jesus. That was the problem with the Pharisees. Now, when you look in the Old Testament, you can see the way God dealt with fallen man. And then they had this mindset of what God looked like. And when Jesus came up, speaking of who he was and what he came to do, it did not look like their interpretation of God. And they said, we don't want this. This is not what we're looking for. Don't let that be you. You beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Don't allow yourself to have a view of God, no matter where you would explain you got it from, no matter how many things you can quote, no matter how many things you can look to and say, this is what God looks like. If it doesn't look like Jesus, then, then you have to own purpose reject that theology. I want to share this verse with you in, in John chapter 1, verse 18. This is the Amplified. I want to read this, and I want you to hear the way the Amplified brings this out. No one has seen God, His essence, His divine nature at any time. The only begotten God who is in the intimate presence of the Father, He has explained Him and interpreted Him and revealed the awesome wonder of the Father. Jesus has explained, interpreted, and revealed the Father. And then somebody's going to tell me, no, this is what the Father looks like, and it doesn't look like Jesus? No, you've got to reject that. You've got the own purpose, put the brakes on, say, no, 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 no. That's not Jesus. Jesus is the only one who has explained, interpreted, and revealed the Father. And if it doesn't look like the character and person of Jesus Christ, I'm not receiving it. Amen. 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 In that portion that I was reading to you in the Good News Translation, in the same way, you are to think of yourselves as dead so far as it is concerning sin. 
but you're to also think of yourselves as living in a fellowship with God through Christ Jesus. The International Standard Version says it this way, you too must continuously consider yourselves. Continuously see it this way. And the reason why you have to continuously do it is because we're still in a fallen world. We're in these bodies that are corruptible. And I have to continually bring everything back into perspective with the word of God, with the will of God, directed by the spirit of God. I have to bring everything back in and say, no, no, this is what happened whenever I was reborn, born again, born from above. That I'm not the same thing I used to be, but I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. And old things, they're passed away. Behold, all things become new. I have to keep bringing that back into play because there's so much doubt and so, much, so many things in the world that is fighting against the word of God and the will of God. But I'm here still. I'm still here walking out this path of righteousness. I'm still here, but the moment I try to do it in my own ability. Oh, man. The moment I start trying to do it because I think I've arrived now. Oh, man. I think I've arrived now and I've got this. I've got it all figured out. And, man, I'm just going to. And I end up moving out on my own and I am destined to fall. That whenever we look at the way he talks about it in Galatians chapter 5, whenever he says the works of the flesh are made manifest, which are these, and then he lists all of these sinful things. And then he points out at the bottom, he says, now, he said, I've already told you guys this before, but if somebody operates in these things, if somebody living this way, functioning in these things, they will not inherit what we're talking about today, the kingdom of God. And whenever, when I realize the way he's positioning that, the way he's showing that, if I am trying to operate in the things of God, if I'm trying to live my life established on my righteousness, if I'm trying to live my life in my own effort or in my own human reasoning, I will to some extent end up in those Galatians chapter 5 sins. I mean, I think we, you will too. So, yeah. We all will end up in something. And see, this is what I see in, in whenever people would come into church and they would, they would hear a message. They would come down, pray a prayer, name Jesus as Lord. But if they don't grasp what we're talking about right now, how to walk in the kingdom, how to perceive the kingdom, if they don't understand it's not my righteousness, it's his righteousness. If they don't come to a place to where they reckon themselves dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ, they'll end up right back where they were. And then people, well, I don't know why the turnover rate's so big. I don't know why so many people prayed this prayer. Paul points it out over and over again in every one of his letters, the same message, he's pointing us right back to it. That's why. It always comes, it didn't, it's not that God failed, it's not necessarily it was a false conversion. It's that somewhere along the line, they didn't think of themselves as dead to sin and living in fellowship with God. And then what they were really thinking, what they were really believing, the way they were truly seeing it as themselves independent from God, trying to be holy, trying to live good, that eventually manifested in their life. And it looks like sin. That's what it looks like. I'm going to say some good things in a minute. I'm, I'm going, this is going to a high point in a minute the way it's going to get much better. Just stay with me. Perceiving the kingdom, acknowledging this kingdom in Luke, Luke chapter 11, verse 20. And in the background on this, Jesus is there. Now he's just taught them to pray. This is what you pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. That's what you pray. So he's just talked them about praying. They, uh, a man who can't speak is brought to Jesus. And Jesus, the Bible says, cast out the demon that had him bound, told it to leave, and the man began speaking immediately, was healed from that moment on. And everybody gets in a fervor at this miracle. 
This is big. This is great. This is awesome. And the religious people, those who had already received the leaven of the Pharisees, they said, oh, no, he's doing this by the power of the devil. He's doing this by the spirit of Beelzebub, the chief of the devil. That's the, don't look at this guy. This is of the devil. And then Jesus makes this statement in Luke chapter 11, verse 20. I'm going to read in the New Living first. He says, if I'm casting out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. The contemporary English says it this way. If I use God's power to force out demons, it proves that God's kingdom has already come to you. So it's something that, that, I, that I realized that I didn't see because whenever I was growing up, I saw people um, have demons cast out of them in service. A lot of times it was a, it was a big show of screaming and yelling. But what I didn't realize was that the majority of time when you see it in the ministry of Jesus... He simply spoke the word, leave. Many times it won't even say much happened, such as the one with the, the man who couldn't speak. It just said, he cast out the demon with a word and it left. Now, it, now we see that there were instances where it threw the boy on the ground, he tore himself, and he told the demon to leave and it, and it left. But the majority of the time, he simply said, unclean spirit, leave. And it left. So many times in my daily life, I would begin to see, this is not of God. This person is operating something that is not of God. And instead of me making a show out of it, instead of me saying, come here, let me anoint you and pray for you, I would just simply say, unclean spirit, you leave. And the entire atmosphere, everything there would change. I mean, I, re I recall one time doing that, and there was a man there who, who, who they had said had done all these horrible things, and he's sitting there mad, don't get close to him. He'll try to bite you. He'll try to spit on you. He'll try to grab you. And I walked up behind him. You unclean spirit, you leave in the name of Jesus. And I said it like at a mumble, and he's like 10 feet away. He's trying, what? I said, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to that spirit you've been listening to. And he, start, I mean, he humbled himself like a little child right there. You see, so many times we are looking for the spectacular and we overlook the supernatural. So many times we're wanting to see a big show, wanting to see something whenever there are miracles happening around us. But it didn't look like what we thought it should look like. I've seen people healed gradually. I've seen people healed instantaneously. I, I've seen deliverance come to people to where they slowly came to an acknowledgement of the truth and delivered themselves from the snare of the devil. I've seen it where sitting in a service, all of a sudden somebody stood up, praise God, I'm free, that's it. Never dealt with that bondage, that addiction again. I've got to be able to have in my Godology, my theology, to where I allow God to operate. Amen? That same portion, whenever Jesus, I want to read it in the New American Standard also, whenever Jesus is telling them, he's explaining the situation of what really happened. New American Standard, he says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And what Jesus is really describing is an invasion. What he's really describing is light dispelling darkness. Whenever so much of what religion tries to explain is, I'm in this darkness. Now, now, what I want you to do is you get all that darkness in so my precious light can come in. No, the light is there to drive out the darkness. The light doesn't struggle and fight with the darkness. You simply bring the light. You simply bring the light. And this is why I, I, God has been directing me back to his teaching in the Sermon on the Mound, where he points out how that, that you, those of you who accept him, those of you who believe on him, you're like a city set on a hill that can't be hid. He said, you're like a, like a lamp that God himself has lit on fire. And nobody's going to take that lamp and put it under a basket. But I'm telling you, so much of what religion has done has done that very thing. Good intentions, bad intentions, who cares what the intentions were? That was the result. Was that they have taken so many people who have hearts for God, who have the light of God inside of them, and said, no, no, we've got to cover that up. You've got to work a job, brother. 
You can't be all Jesus like that and be on a job somewhere. You understand that's what that job needs. You can't be in this school. You can't be in this company. If you're going to be sharing Jesus like that, that's what that place needs. That's why it's falling apart. That's why it's decaying. That's why, that's why all the bad things are being allowed in these places is because the light that God sent that no man can put out, that, that the enemy cannot come and extinguish it, but the light bearers. The light bearers are refusing to shine. The light bearers are refusing to shine for a lot of good reasons. Good, good in a derogatory way. It wasn't good reasons. For a lot of reasons that they think are good. What Jesus was describing here was the light dispelling darkness. It's the same thing that's happening whenever he's given the great commission. In Mark chapter 16, verse 17 and 18, I'm going to paraphrase this portion. And these signs shall follow them that believe in the authority of Jesus. They shall drive out demons. Receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Have divine protection. Place their hands on those who are sick and see them healed. You understand that is describing an invasion of a kingdom. That's describing an invasion. And so many times people are waiting for God to make them do it. Oh, God, if you just grab my hand and put it on that lady's head, I'd pray for her. Oh, God, if you just shake me and make me do it, I'd go and do it right now. If you just, just start walking my feet that way, Jesus, and I'll go. Whenever in reality it's that simple act of obedience, I already know what the Word says on that issue. And, and now if I get some special thing from God, now some people, they try to do special things to make it look spectacular whenever that's not what God told them to do right then. But with so many times, if God directs your heart, that's why that balance of spirit and truth is so important. I have to know, man, right now, it doesn't always look the same. God's telling me to come and speak this word to you. God's telling me to come and give you this thing. God's telling me to come and whatever. But if I don't get that direct word... I've got his word right here. I'm going to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I'm going to tell that demon to leave in the name of Jesus. If you don't get that special word, I still don't get to disobey his word. In this, he's describing an invasion of the kingdom, but because many people have not perceived the kingdom. Because what they're really thinking is, if I step out on that limb and fall on my face, what am I going to do then? Instead of them thinking of themselves in union with God, instead of them seeing themselves, considering constantly themselves in this union with the Father, instead of them seeing themselves in this relationship with God to where I only do those things that please the Father, to where I'm in Him and He's in me and we're walking this out because if I try to do it on my own, then I'm not just a little wrong, I'm wrong if I try to do it on my own, I miss the mark every time. What's the definition of sin? Yep, you miss the mark. That's what it is. It's missing the mark. This is the mindset whenever the writer says in the scripture, whatever is not of faith, where my Bible scholars at? Whatever is not of faith is sin. And that's not, he's not trying, I'm going to condemn all you people here. No, he's trying to get them to a place to where they acknowledge and perceive the kingdom of God, where they acknowledge and understand, hey, I get the privilege of doing this. I get this privilege. How much longer do I have here, God? From the youngest person to the older per person in here, it's not long. I don't have much longer to be here, but the small slice of time that I get to be here I get the privilege of walking out this kingdom life. I get the privilege of seeing myself in union with the Father and living a life bigger than is humanly possible. I believe it was uh, Valentin who made this statement. We are in commission, co-mission, union. We are in co-mission when we are in submission to the primary mission. That's good. 
We are in co-mission when we are in submission to the primary mission. We have to see it. We have to perceive it. We have to consider it. We have to think continuously. We have to believe in the kingdom, the principles of the kingdom of God, and then get to a place to where finally it's not just principles anymore. I don't just believe in the principle of it. I believe it. I don't just believe in the new birth. I'm experiencing it. I'm walking in it. I don't just believe in the kingdom, but I'm perceiving the king's dominion in my life and anybody who's dumb enough to get close to me. They're going to see it too. Why? Because the kingdom of God is a hand's reach. It's right here. It's right now. It comes down to, will I walk in the flesh or walk in the spirit? Flesh is my own effort and my own understanding. And most people, I'm talking about good people, people that, that I know they love God, most people that we will ever meet, they're stuck right here. And they've got good religious reasons why. They're stuck in their own head and in their own carnal reasoning. Just before in, in Romans chapter 5, just before he got to the portion I read you in Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 5, verse 17, he says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive what I'm going to talk about, most people will not receive it. Most as in, if you had 100 people, the majority of those people, they're not going to go this far with it. They which receive abundance of grace, and the gift of righteousness shall reign in this life by one Jesus Christ. And this is why it seems like it's a special thing. When pastor so-and-so and reverend so-and-so or sister so-and-so, man, she, she's a woman of God. And she's walking that, oh man, you want somebody to pray for you? You call him, you call her. And it seemed as if, man, it's big eyes and little U's. No, no, they, they were just one of the, the ones that received it is what it was. They were the ones who were willing to continually think of themselves dead to sin and in union with God. They were one of the ones who did what he said in Romans chapter 12, refused to be conformed to the world, and then they were transformed by the renewing of their mind, and it looked different. Because now they're proving out and showing what the perfect will of God is, and that looks strange. And I'm telling you, any one of us in here right now could say, no, no, that's who I'm going to be. I, I'm starting to perceive the kingdom greater than I did before. And the key is, you don't have to understand it all with your head. You don't wrap, have to wrap all your knowledge around it and be able to explain it all. But you have to be willing. You have to be willing and open and say, God, your way. I want what you want, God. Not my will, but your will, God. And I can plainly see that Jesus Christ is the will of God. And so many people who are bound up in religion hate that. The demons that have been directing the theology that they're following hates that. The things that they are bound up to hate what I'm talking about right now. And will do anything to keep them by the throat. Keep them suffering. Keep them blaming God for all the faults and all the failures. Keep them, from keep them in a place to where they're saying, it's just God doing it. I don't know why God this is to me, but he, you know, he's got his own way. And you know, just whatever God wants. Instead of them realizing that God is not their problem. He is the answer to the problem. That there is a real devil who came to steal, kill, and to destroy. And Jesus, he came for opposite reasons. That you would have life and that you would have it more abundantly. And the leaven of the Pharisee is there saying, oh, no, no, we're switching those roles. And people who have swallowed that hook, line, and sinker, that's the hardest people you will ever meet to convince otherwise. And, and I've even had people who, who they, they started seeing it. They started reading the scripture. They started seeing it. And, and, and I've had some of the saddest cases I've ever had where they came to me and said, but I've been doing this my whole life. And I've been a part of this domination my whole life. And this is just what I've always believed. And if I, if I acknowledge that what this is saying is true, then all my friends, 
And what is, what is that? It's called a fear of man is what it is. And a fear of man is a trap. And these people who are caught up in that, and, and I'm, I'm praying for them, and, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm standing in faith for, for them to see the light of the gospel, for them to come out of that. I'm not saying that, that, li- that they're on their way to hell, but I'm saying that their life is being destroyed. Their lives are being destroyed. The things that they love are being taken advantage of by the enemy. Whenever the answer's already come, and they're saying, well, you've got to send something better than Jesus. I know Jesus did some good things, and I know that he sent the Holy Spirit, rah, 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 but do something better now. They don't really say it that way. That's, I was just saying the way that they think. <laughs> I hope they don't say it that way. But that mindset that people get caught up in, and it's sad. I mean, it, if I focus on it too long, I'm going to get sad, but I'm not going to focus on it. That mindset that I see so many people are bound up in and taken by can be easily broken off in one instance. It only takes one encounter with God. It only takes one meeting with this Jesus Christ. It only takes one chance of sincerity of them saying, okay, I don't have it all put together. I don't know everything. God, I want your way and not what I've just been thinking. I want the truth. Scripture had even pointed out in the Old Covenant, he said, anywhere, at any time, if someone will just simply seek God with all their heart, they shall find me. He's not far from any of us. He's not hiding. He's not trying to get away from us. He's here. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Now, this account is where Peter had just received revelation Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus looks at him and says, Flesh and blood didn't reveal this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. You're blessed, Peter. And then just a few moments into it, this is what happened. Jesus starts describing and explaining his, about how he was going to be suffer, how he was going to suffer, how he was going to be crucified. And Peter Switches gears, apparently. And instead of him receiving from the Father, he started thinking with his own mind, his own will, his own emotions. I don't want that to happen. We don't want that to happen. Not so, Lord. And this was what Jesus' response to him. And it seems harsh. But in Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, in the New King James, and he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. What what was offending Jesus in this situation? You're not mindful of the things of God, but you are mindful of what? The things of men. That's accepted now. To be totally focused on the things and opinions of people and discredit the opinion and the things of God is accepted and even seen as holy in some places. But he plainly points out here that it's not. That same in the New Living Translation. He said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. How many times have I done that? How many times have I just looked at this situation from a human point of view and not from God's? The God's Word translation, get out of my way, Satan. You are tempting me to sin. You aren't thinking the way God thinks, but the way humans think. You have been given the mind of, you've been given the mind of Christ. We, you see, th- this is the, the fight of faith. This is the good fight of faith. I'm looking out and I'm seeing all these things contrary to the promises of God. And then I'm saying, no, no, I'm not looking at this in the natural. I'm looking at this through the cross of Calvary. I'm looking at this through the finished work of Jesus Christ. The Good News Translation. He said, get away from me, Satan. 
You are an obstacle in my way because those thoughts of yours don't come from God, but from human nature. Man, I thought it was okay. I thought that me entertaining doubt was okay. I thought that me reading the scripture, I don't know. I've always thought this. I thought that was okay for a long time. It's not okay. It's not okay for me to have thoughts that don't come from God. This is one time people would send me videos of, 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 of debates between atheists and, and, and uh, apologists. And, and that's got its place. I'm not condemning that. But so much of that, I would listen to atheists and be like, oh, that's a good point. Never thought about that. I was entertaining that man's thoughts instead of entertaining the word of God. I was acknowledging that thought pattern, receiving that in, mulling that over. That's called meditating. Instead of me doing that to the word of God. And it will result in things that are not of God being manifest in my life. That one more translation on it, that same one in the World English Bible, Matthew 16, 23. Get, be, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God. But what are you setting your mind on? The things of men. Man. Now, whenever we're talking, this seems like something so basic and so easy, but I'm telling you, people miss this. Man, we miss this whenever a doctor says, here's my report. And we look at that, and we start mulling that over, and we start thinking about all the people we know who died of that. We start looking at that, and we start meditating on that report. I start setting my mind on that. None of you have ever done that. I've done that, but none of you have ever done that. I'm telling you, we're prone to that. But there has to come that place to where you own purpose. Say, no, 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 I acknowledge that. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to deny reality what's going on here, but I'm going to push that aside, and now I'm going to own purpose, acknowledge God. I'm going to own purpose, stop putting my mind on the things of men and I'm going to start putting my, th my mind on the things of God. I'm going to start thinking God thoughts. I'm going to stop looking at what I can see in the natural. Stop walking by faith. I mean, stop walking by sight and start walking by faith. That point that comes in whenever I had broken my back and thank God I had Crystal there who was, who was, who was looking out for that most people would have just been praying into the ether, God do something good. It's like, no, 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 he's already done the good. Now you need to keep your mind right. You need to keep your mind focused on the things of God. You need to start acknowledging the cross of Calvary, that, that by his stripes you were healed. Until you see that were healed into are healed, now healed. Something like that. But start acknowledging that, start seeing that. And not just whenever something big happens in my life, but in my daily life when I get up in the morning and I sit down and I say, well, God, I'm not going to set my mind just on what I have to do for today, but I'm going to start setting my mind on you and your way and your word. I'm going to start thinking your thoughts today about what I need to do today in your kingdom. I'm not just going to sit back and just, just rest like a son in the kingdom, but I'm going to receive my, my, my job and labor in the kingdom too. I'm closing with this. In Matthew, no, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him, speaking of Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Understand, that's who you really are. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And, and, and just looking at that perspective of who you are, that changes the vast majority of the doubt and unbelief and the hindrances in your life. And now in the same way that I do that, I start acknowledging 
that my righteousness is only in Christ alone, that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, I start applying that to the other areas of my life. I start looking at anything that is broken, anything that is missing, anything that is lame in my life, and I say, well, I'm not just going to keep focused on the error. I'm not going to stay focused on the things of this world and the things of man, but I'm going to own purpose. What is God's word on that? What is God's opinion of that? So many times that comes back to the mentality of understanding that what truly pleases God is to give you the kingdom. Having that understanding of who you are, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now how can I see this lived out in my family? How can I see this lived out in my broken body? How can I see this lived out in the other areas of my life It comes down to acknowledging this is what pleases God. It pleases God to give me the kingdom. To see the king's authority working in me and through me. I want to ask if you'll do something with me in closing. I want to ask if you'll just close your eyes. And I want to go through this this little quick portion. We went through a lot of scriptures on this same thing. But I want you to close your eyes and I I want you to acknowledge the truth of what I'm going to say to you right now. God is not your enemy. God is not your problem. God isn't causing you to suffer. God isn't stealing from you. God is not making you sick. God is not allowing bad things in your life to teach you something. God does not hate you. God sent Jesus to die in your place because He loves you. God has given you access to His life, to His name, to His power, to His authority, to His Spirit, to His promise, to His armor, to His miraculous gift, to His nature, and His abundance, grace, mercy, and love, and joy, and peace, and purpose. He has given you the keys to His kingdom. Renew your heart and your mind to these truths. Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace, and we receive it right now. Father, we're perceiving your kingdom in a greater way. We're acknowledging the work that you've already done through Jesus Christ in a greater way. The situation, the cares of this life that are sent to choke the word and keep us from being profitable, we denounce those things. We we own purpose Lay aside any weight and any sin that is there to beset us. We look totally to Jesus. We look to this finished work. We look to His message declaring your kingdom. And we receive that. We confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. We believe in our heart that you have raised him from the dead. We receive this salvation. We own purpose. Refuse to be conformed to this world. But we are being transformed through the renewing of our minds. We stand poised and ready to show forth your will in the earth, to show forth your way in the earth, to declare your dominion, to declare your kingdom come and your will be done. Father, we thank you and we praise you, God. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Amen. How many of you received something from God today? Yes. 
Amen. Pastor Dave.